Mr. Secretary, thanks very much for a great speech. Fantastic to have you here. Thank you, no, it's great to be with you. You mentioned President Reagan a couple of times. In fact, he once said to an audience, very much like this one, um, before I refuse to take your questions, I'll have a statement. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you agree to take some questions. And that is a good moment. He might have had the better line than I had. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, it's, we'll, see, it's, we'll, we'll see here in just a minute. Yeah. It's a good line. So, um, so, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you um, to write your questions on those little cards, we'll come and collect them, and then we'll pick the, the smartest ones and the most difficult ones, <laughs> probably. So, Mr. Secretary, you talked at length about China. Um, you mentioned this um, strategic and, and also ideological rivalry between Washington and, and Beijing. And I'm afraid to say that Marxism was probably a German export to China, <laughs> but that's, that's a different story. Yes. Um, so I, I was kind of trying to, to connect the historical dots here. Um, we're sitting in front of Brandenburg Gate, which was for a long time the symbol of the Cold War and became the symbol of the end of the Cold War. Now, I wanted to ask you whether you think that this Sino-American rivalry, is that the Cold War of the 21st century? So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as a um, conflict between the United States and China. Uh, Chinese people, we, we have huge trade relationship with China, so, so do German companies. Uh, the Chinese people are an innovative, smart, capable set of people. It's the Chinese Communist Party. And it's not between the United States and China. It's the challenge between uh, the Chinese Communist Party and its authoritarian regime and freedom-loving peoples all across the world. Uh, you, you, you all can see it. Those of you who travel to China can see uh, how President Xi has moved their country in this direction. You just need to look at the fact that they've put weapon systems now in the South China Sea. They're using information technology to uh, do credit scoring against their own peoples that will extend to every individual whose personal information they get access to. So as you think about networks, as you think about who's going to control the rules of uh, communications connect connectivity in the next decades, you should think about whether you would have permitted the Soviet Union to control your infrastructure, your network communications infrastructure. Um, it's a reasonable question. Uh, and so this challenge is to take the people who value the rule of law, who want to preserve freedom, who despise authoritarianism, and make sure that we are working together to push back against any regime that threatens its own people in the world with this, with this ideology. Um, that message is very much appreciated, Mr. Secretary, and I think a lot of people in this, in this room would agree that we as Europeans and Americans have to stand together um, when we deal with that challenge. I mean, many opportunities in, in, in the rise of China, but also a lot of challenges. So in doing so, wouldn't it be better if we were kind of not imposing tariffs on each other's goods? Yes, we wish you wouldn't impose money. tariffs on us. Yes, we, <laughs> we, con we concur. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but President Trump's been clear. He's been very clear. Our ideal trade relationship with the European Union would be to have no tariffs between either of our two countries, no non-tariff barriers either, no hiding behind some regulatory framework that says somehow that American agriculture isn't safe for the European people to eat. Right? These, the, this is not the way uh, free peoples interact and trade with each other. And this is, this is what President Trump's been driving towards. We, we want increased trade with Europe. We want increased trade with India. Uh, but we want it to be conducted in a way that's consistent with the history of free trade around the world, where uh, we join together and uh, we don't try and protect our own industries. We compete freely and fairly. Sometimes European businesses will be more successful than American businesses, so be it. Uh, sometimes the American company will be more successful. Often you'll not know which it is. There'll be shareholders that come from all across the world, from Europe and the United States, so it's very complex. But as the sovereign states uh, interact with each other and trade across sovereign boundaries, uh, the idea is that you have fair, free, reciprocal trade with as little trade friction as you can possibly imagine and allow competition to flourish so that each of our peoples can continue to grow and prosper. That's the mission set that our administration is engaged in. Right. I just wanted to make sure you're not thinking that we are worse than China. So, <laughs> um, 
Anyways, um, here's yes, the- we, we ought not let the narrative of some of the, uh, of some of the media out there uh, get in the way of the, the reality, uh, right? So that, that you're somehow suggesting that, uh, uh, that there, was, there was even a remote comparison um, in, the, in the way we think about the value sets that reside inside the Chinese Communist Party and the value sets that we know and appreciate in Europe, the democracies of Europe. They're, they're fundamentally different and America knows this. So, now over to your questions, ladies and gentlemen, and here's one about the future of Ukraine. Um, and let me read that one out. How committed is the US to peace and stability in Ukraine, question mark, without any preconditions, question mark? Very. Very? Very, very committed, very. Okay. yes. Yes, uh, uh, it's a project we've been working on. Uh, I remember I was at the Munich Security Conference when I was a member of Congress in Kansas, and I remember pushing the topic at this time was whether defensive weapon systems would be provided to the Ukrainians. This must have been 2015 or 16. Uh, and I remember, and I remember uh, Germany deciding it was a bad idea and America deciding it was a bad idea, President Obama deciding it wasn't something he wanted to do. Uh, in fact, President Trump has now not once, not twice, but three times come to uh, provide the uh, tools so that the Ukrainian people can protect themselves from Russian aggression in the Donbass. Uh, we're proud of that. We think it makes sense. We think it makes sense for freedom. We think it makes sense for Europe. And we think it makes sense for the world and Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, we, we're very clear about um, our, our position on uh, there, the invasion of Crimea that happened in the previous administration uh, and how it is we're going to work to develop a, a, a prosperous Ukraine that is less corrupt and capable of, of moving itself towards the West. Thank you. Um, here's another one about Syria. So um, this is in German, so I have to translate as, as we go along. <laughs> you can read in German and then I'll just... <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I'll manage. I'll give him my best oh. shot. <laughs> so... <laughs> Drank a few beers and by right, I, 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 got, a, I got a chance. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so in Syria, um, the U.S. exposed the Kurds to the Turkish forces. That's what it said, um, and it paved the way for Moscow to to come in. So has that done harm to the credibility of U.S. foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, it's just I think that doesn't frame the question properly. Uh, the United States didn't didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, the, the United States, in fact, provided enormous resources to the SDF and to the Kurds, resources that no other nation, including any European nation, was prepared to provide them. And we did so alongside of you. There were French partners that joined us. There were uh, uh, British partners that joined us. Uh, we're proud of that work. We destroyed the caliphate. When President Trump came into office, they owned real estate that amounted to the size doesn't mean as much. I should have picked a German state, but the size of Ohio, uh, they owned it. They controlled it. They raised taxes. They governed. They had schools and hospitals and medical facilities. This is the terrorists that were beheading people simultaneously. When we came to office, that was the condition in the eastern part of Syria, northeastern part of Syria that is, uh, has a, a Kurdish majority. Uh, this administration provided the resources to Kurds so that that would not occur. We're very proud of that, and we're continuing to provide them support. Uh, we're doing it because we have a vested interest. We think Europe has an interest in this as well. There are hundreds and hundreds of foreign terrorist fighters that are going to have to go somewhere. Um, we need each nation to thoughtfully consider whether it's appropriate for them to come back so that they can prosecute them there so that they don't roam free, that our kids and grandkids don't have to fight them again. Uh, and the United States is committed. Wherever we find radical Islamic terrorism, we'll continue to stay at it. And you've seen President Trump actions in the last few weeks, uh, we're going to take the appropriate response so that the uh, ISIS fighters can't get a hold of the oil fields there. But just as I spoke to in my speech, we need friends around the world who care about freedom and who want to help us fight terror around the world. We need them to join us. These can't be American propositions alone. Uh, they need to be done by all of us who care so much. You, Europe has the real risk that if we don't get this right, that there'll be enormous migration from this region uh, into Europe. Uh, we want. We want, and I think European countries want them to be able to live in their own country. We want, right, they want to live in their own country. And we need to do the things we can do to take down this terrorist threat so that we can get a political resolution inside of Syria and so that the people, now some six million who have been displaced, can return to their homes. Mm. 
Right, but let me press you a bit more on that Syria issue still, Mr. Secretary. Um, after that withdrawal happened, um, I had a chance but, uh, to... But uh, uh, that, you... that's the wrong verb. Okay. okay. And it's so important, it's important. That pullback. Yeah, uh, no, no, it's, it's not, it's, again, it's, it's, we, we are doing, we are performing the mission set. President Erdogan made a decision to conduct an incursion into Turkey. We opposed that. Uh, so, did, so did the German government, so did the French government. Uh, President Erdogan made that decision. We have made the strategic decision that we're going to continue the counter-ISIS campaign there. Right. That, that's what's happening in Syria today. We're there. Young men and women that work for the American Department of Defense are putting their lives at risk there today. Young officers that work for me in the United States Department of State are on the ground in Syria today. We need you all to join us. If you care, if it matters so much, as the question suggests, and I would concur that the questioner's predicate suggests it is important, and I agree, we need each country to go to their people and make the case why this is an important challenge, worthy of undertaking, worthy of putting people's lives at risk, our own citizens' lives at risk. Right. No, that, that message is understood. But still, when, when that Syria thing occurred, I had the chance to, to travel to, to, to the region, in fact, and I talked to you know, a number of people and, and some of them U U.S. allies, and they were kind of concerned, and they told me, Nora, we start to think that Russia is maybe the more reliable ally in the region than, than is the U.S. Is that something that concerns you, or are they completely... Yes, like it does concern me. When people are irrational, it always concerns mm. me. Yeah. To, to think of Russia as a worthy partner, mm. engaged in the same undertaking that we all are, mm. taking down the threat of terrorism around the world or promoting freedom and prosperity and uh, the economic well-being of citizens around the world, to think that Russia would remotely be a partner anything like the United States or anything like a European country is irrational. Hmm. And so, yes, I, I'm concerned when people are irrational, it always bothers me. Okay. So here's another question from, from um, the audience. Um, it's about Hong Kong, in fact. Um, and I'll read it out. You said freedom will prevail. What is your advice to Hong Kong demonstrators right now? Settle for what they have achieved peacefully or continue to struggle? This will be up to the human spirit, the people of Hong Kong. We've, we've, we've made very clear that to the leadership in China that it's our expectation that the Chinese government will honor their commitment. They made a promise uh, to the people in the region that they would uh, adhere to a fundamental system that allowed um, a difference. There'd be one country and two systems. We've asked the Chinese government uh, to maintain the promise that they made that they made to their own people. And as for the people of Hong Kong, they'll, they'll, they'll make their own decision, they'll find their own path forward. We've, we've, we've suggested to all the parties in the region that violence is a bad idea, um, but the struggle for freedom continues. We see it not just in Hong Kong, um, we see it in the streets of Beirut, we see it in the streets of Baghdad, where peoples are rising up against the Islamic Republic of Iran. They want to be Iraqi. They want to be Lebanese, not Hezbollah. They want to be uh, Iraqi, not part of a Iranian militia. Uh, I, I think that uh, those of us who are freedom-loving peoples all across the world need to support those people wherever we can and make sure uh, that they have the capacity and the tools to achieve the outcomes that they choose to seek. Hmm. And will the U.S. come um, to, to those demonstrators' aid at some point? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to get in front of any policy decision that we've made. Um, in the end, uh, the, the world has the obligation to provide the capacity and the guidance, but in the end, these peoples will lead these struggles successfully. Uh, I, mean, look, I saw it. I was, with, I was with some amazing people last night who were in East Germany, and uh, they talked about their prayer gatherings because the churches were the only place that they could go to get themselves away from the uh, the stairs of the communists of the Stasi. It's amazing. It's amazing what freedom and the yearning for freedom inside those people said. I'm convinced that there are people all around the world who want this same thing and that we, our obligation, those of us who value those freedoms, our obligation is to provide them the support uh, that they need when we can and where we can. So here's a, a very short and concise question. It's about NATO. Is NATO... I'm for it. 
<laughs> for the record. <laughs> so I think you've already preempted the answer. But go. I'll read it out anyways. All right. So is NATO obsolete or brain dead or both <laughs> or neither? Uh, you know, <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so many good answers. <laughs> So many cameras, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so 70 years on NATO now, uh, it needs to grow and change. It needs to confront the realities of today and the challenges of today. They're different, they're fundamentally different. When the German soldiers patrolled the full the gap, it was a different time than it is today. Uh, and so, NATO runs always the risk that it will become obsolete, not because the partnership, not because the political commitments will ever become. I don't think as between the, in the transatlantic on those commitments between our countries will ever become obsolete. Uh, but it, could, it does run that risk if it doesn't do the things it needs to do to confront the challenges of today in a way that is effective. If nations believe that they can get the security benefit without providing NATO the resources that it needs, if they don't live up to their commitments, there's a risk that NATO could become ineffective or obsolete. Um, so we need to be mindful. It's what I spoke about today. Uh, these things, we can never take these things for granted. We can never uh, assume that because there's this infrastructure and this beautiful building that sits in Brussels and that, that, it will, that it will exist and that it will, of its own force, just by the nature of it, will continue to be relevant and important and effective. We need to work and be thoughtful and challenge the underlying presumptions that we built upon and say, how do we ensure that this structure is appropriate 70 years on? If we do that, NATO and the uh, political alliances that underlay it will continue to be incredibly valuable to each of our peoples. Hmm. And 10 years from now, we'll be sitting here together celebrating NATO's 80th birthday. Yes, me and my wheelchair will be all be good. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Secretary, I have one more question that I wanted to ask you. It's not about foreign, yeah, it's a little bit about foreign policy actually. So um, you played basketball during high school and I'm told you played forward. Power forward, yes. Yeah, yes. so um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what do a, or what does a, a power forward have in common with a foreign minister? Yeah. So that was a joke. At 5'11", I wasn't much of a power forward. Uh, <laughs> well under two meters, yes. Uh, you know, uh, you, you learn a lot, uh, I think, playing team sports in that way. Uh, because I think you come to appreciate that y you can have a star, they can carry you a long ways. Um, but if you don't figure out how to make one plus one equal 2.2 .2 or 2.3, if you can't build a team that collectively can deliver, you'll, you'll only rise so far. I think the same thing sitting as the America's foreign minister, as the secretary of state, I think the same thing. If um, the United States can do a lot, we're a very capable nation. Uh, we can achieve a lot of good things for our people. Um, but we need, we need partners and allies around the world to do this together. It's a competitive landscape, much like in basketball. Uh, some years one team has a little bit more power, more capacity, more influence, uh, and a decade later, no more. Uh, that doesn't happen by chance. It happens because uh, good peoples gather together to go deliver a team's outcome, go deliver against a mission set. In basketball, it's simple, score more than the other team. And in national security and foreign policy space, it's to make sure we understand why it is we're doing what we're doing, why it is our value set matters and then communicate that, every leader's obligation. It's easy to do, by the way, it's easy to ignore. Every leader's obligation is to go back to their home village, city, state, and make the case for why the expenditure of resources, time, talent, lives, uh, why that's necessary to make the case for why the, if we don't do it, the next generation won't have all the things that our kids have today. Uh, the same thing's true in sports. If you don't make the case about why it is you're trying to, to build out a team in a certain way, then you're at some risk of failure. Uh, I think the analogy might be carried a little bit too far, uh, but I, I do think it's absolutely imperative uh, that we uh, identify what the competition looks like, what the threats are, what our uh, adversaries are trying to do, and then build our collective efforts to ensure that our way of life, the way of life that we all care so deeply about uh, is still around 20 and 40 and 50 years in, from now.
so it's really all about being a good team. On this note, Mr. Secretary, thank you very, very much. It's been an immense honor and a great pleasure to have you with us at the Kerber Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, for actively listening, and for the great questions. And I can only say, let's keep, in, let's keep talking to each other, with each other, rather than about one another. Thank you very Amen. much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you all so much. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.